Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I am your host, Mikey Girolamo, bringing you the news and inspiration from nature's front line. This podcast was recorded and edited on Gadigal land in the Aura Nation. Film and television fans who may be listening to this podcast are probably familiar with the Austin, Texas-based film festival and conference, South by Southwest, which began in 1987. This year, the renowned festival got its first international edition, and it came to Sydney, Australia, where I had the privilege of attending it. Film and TV isn't the only medium celebrated at this massive gathering. There are scores of interactive media companies, artists, and scientists who work in video games, tech, music, health and wellness, environmental science, and conservation. There was a lot to see and do here as there were over 700 speakers across 300 panels. So I stuck to events that focused on issues related to the environment. Fortunately, I had the opportunity to speak with a few really interesting panelists, including marine ecologist at the University of New South Wales, Adriana Virgis, coral reef experts Dean Miller and John Charlie Varon from the Forever Reef Project, and Mike Black, co-founder of Australian biotech startup Rainstick. I had several minutes with each of these guests immediately following their respective panel discussions. Due to time constraints, I had to keep my questions to the point, and a lot of them referenced something they said in their discussions, so I'm providing a little bit of context before each of these conversations. The first I want to highlight was from the Forever Reef Project, which is helmed by Dean Miller and John Charlie Varon, two marine scientists working on collecting and maintaining a biobank of the world's coral reef species. Miller is a BBC presenter and also an Australian Geographic sponsored explorer, as well as the managing director and co-founder of the non-profit, The Great Barrier Reef Legacy. He was joined in a panel by renowned Australian marine biologist John Varon, who goes by Charlie, who is responsible for naming 20% of the world's coral reefs, and also Sharon Edmonston, creative director of the MNC Saatchi Group. In our conversation, Miller highlights the urgency behind his team's effort, as the marine conditions this summer in the Southern Hemisphere make a catastrophic bleaching event quite possible on the Great Barrier Reef. Some 180 species into the collection, Miller says his team is 100 dives away from procuring the rest of the collection on the Great Barrier Reef. While the project is not directly involved in restoration efforts or studying the corals for scientific research, Miller and his team are making the biobank available for all of the above. Uh, so, Dr. Miller, uh, thank you very much for speaking with me today. So, I want to really quick just sort of highlight something that um, Charlie mentioned that I think is really important. You said that it's possible for the Great Barrier Reef to actually, the, for us to lose the entire thing by February. Uh, can you go ahead and just briefly explain how that would happen? Sure. I guess what Charlie was referring to there was the fact that uh, we're already in an El Nino weather pattern and the water temperature is already elevated. And should we get very clear, sunny conditions with no wind, um, that would actually, uh, I guess, amplify the bleaching effect. Um, and so, you know, coral bleaching happens because A, temperature is high, but B, because there is direct sunlight and corals are actually overproducing uh, and they create like a, an oxygen toxicity within the tissue, and then the coral gets rid of all its algae in its tissue, which is what bleaching actually is. Um, should that sustain for a, a you know period of time, a couple of weeks to a month or two, um, that's when you get coral death. And that's what we saw in 2016. And funnily enough, we're going back into that same weather pattern that we saw in 2016. So Charlie was kind of saying, you know, this could all be catastrophic by February. And he's absolutely right. Should the conditions line up, we could lose a, a huge part of the Great Barrier Reef um, by February. And so you said that um, you could complete the entire collection in, in about 100 dives. So I'm, I'm guessing that these next few months are going to be crucial for you and your team. Yeah, look, we've collected 181 hard coral species from the Great Barrier Reef already, uh, representing about 43% of the biodiversity. There are about 415 species of coral. Um, and so our job now is to get out there and try to get as many representatives of every one of those species before it's too late. And ideally, we want to get that done before the end of 2026. We're giving ourselves a two-year window. Um, but, you know, the way things are shaping up, the predictions of weather, 
and um, and uh, sea surface temperatures and and catastrophic potential bleaching, we may not even have that long to collect them all. And uh, something you said it really surprised me in the panel. You you said um, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but you said Australia, the Australian government doesn't fund conservation. Can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Yeah, sure. Um, and this is our experience, you know, directly is, you know, government funds research, they fund uh, experimentation, they fund management, but they don't fund conservation. And that's why I guess in the the social media space, we're constantly being asked, you know, save the koalas, save the rainforest, and for us, help us save the biodiversity of the, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and it's because governments don't fund conservation, um, which is a, a strange concept, but we kind of fall between the cracks when we, we look at government funding. We're not research. Uh, we're, we're just pure application of good science, technology, and skills. And so we are, in effect, conservation. So um, our listeners and readers at Manga Bear, they're pretty well aware of the, the threats that, that corals face, but something unprecedented this year is, is the ocean temperatures. And, you know, already a year ago, you know, two years ago, scientists were saying that we could lose, you know, somewhere around 90% of coral reef species by like 2050. Um, so what's it looking like now, given the temperatures that we experienced in the ocean this year? This estimate has some variation, but the United Nations Environment Program said about two years ago that we could lose between 70% and 90% of live coral reefs by 2050 with 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. These figures are also backed up by the IPCC in 2018, but the complicating factor this year is ocean temperatures, and of course the fact that the world saw the hottest ever July and August and September since record keeping began. Notably, July wasn't just the hottest month on record, but also likely the hottest in 120,000 years. It's funny because everyone talks about 2050, and I'm not sure why we talk about 2050, but we don't have that long. We really don't. Um, Florida this summer just experienced 37 degree water. 37 degrees Celsius. Um, that is effectively coral death. Um, and so, you know, I think we've, we've really got to be on guard for what is possible. And what is possible is now potentially catastrophic for coral reefs. Yeah. So it's, um, it's coming quicker than we, we're, well, it's not coming quicker than we thought because when you speak to Charlie, he has predicted this for the last 15 years. And I'd hate to have his perspective of, you know, last 45 years diving on the world's coral reefs and, and watching them slowly, you know, decline while also being that, you know, whistleblower almost, but not being uh, heard or, or just seeing governments not take any action. And look, we can do everything we want on the ground. We can, we can collect corals, we can uh, restore reefs, we can remove crown of starfish, but we've also got to address climate change. And unless we really reduce our carbon emissions, we're not going to solve this problem. You've, you've got to have both happening at the exact same time. And so um, something I wanted to ask about was that you, you mentioned breeding heat adaptive strains, heat adaptive corals. Uh, can that be done? Or at least do you plan to try and do that with as many species as possible? Yeah. So that is not our job. Um, that is uh, work of other scientists around the world looking at genetically modified coral species that are more heat tolerant. And so, you know, scientists are already very aware that our oceans are warming and we're going to need to, it's called assisted evolution. We're, we're trying to assist the corals to evolve quicker and, and through genetic modification. So our job is really collect all the corals and hold onto them for their pure conservation, but to make them available for these research and restoration efforts as kind of brood or, you know, the, the, the wild stock, which they're going to need to do. Um, but yeah, corals are uh, corals. Scientists are tinkering with how we can almost trick corals into uh, living in in warmer oceans. And so right now they're working on a couple of species. There are 415 species on the Great Barrier Reef, so it's it's certainly not there yet. And um, you know we're really going to be careful of of releasing a cane toad or a rabbit or a pest that is you know genetically modified, almost like a Terminator coral, if you will. Um, so. You know, they're going to be very, very cautious about trying to release this technology. Do they wait till they've got the whole 415 modified and ready to go? Do they do it species by species? These are massive questions and we're not ready for it. 
Right. It seems like it's happening uh, incredibly quickly, especially with uh, regards to um, ocean temperatures. But as we know, that's not the only f- threat they face. There's other things such as the increase of, uh, you know, human effluent into into the ocean, which uh, which is, you know, causing lots of impacts. Um, does your project look at helping mitigate any of that at all? No, we are just purely a coral arc and our job is just to collect the corals and hold on to them. Uh, and it's funny because, you know, prior 2016, where we, we started seeing those mass bleaching events, we were worried, worried about tourism, overfishing, uh, you know, sedimentation, nutrient loads, but nothing even compares to what the impact of, of coral bleaching can be. And so, you know, in the last six years, we've seen four mass coral bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef, um, which is four more than we've ever seen in geological history. So this is, you know, really ramping up very, very fast. And uh, in the 2016 and 2017 bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef, we had about a thousand kilometers of reefscape probably permanently modified in the space of about two to three months. So this is quick. So it doesn't matter how good your water quality is. It doesn't matter how many starfish you've removed. Like these are all good things to try to control. But when this overriding factor comes into play, which is climate change, there is no escape from that. So, um, yeah, we really need to focus on that more than anything. Um, and I know you've already mentioned that you don't you don't have any um, you know government funding and and you're subsisting off of donations, I believe, based on what you just told me there. Um, do you have any plans to work with uh, universities or academic departments in helping study or research things like like the other gentleman in the room mentioned, which is like like biomedical research? Yeah, um, our plan is to complete the collection first and then make it available to reef research and restoration efforts, but also any researchers who want to like bioprospecting, which is what you're referring to, like sort of you know, how can uh, the pharmaceutical world benefit from what we're actually collecting? Absolutely. This collection will be open and available to you know anyone that wants to access it, but um, our job is purely to hold on to the corals and get them safe and sound. Uh, there was a lot of talk and a lot of uh, some, some criticisms that, uh, uh, that Charlie had about the media coverage. Um, what do you want to see people talk about more um, when we mention coral reefs? I think of uh, the importance of coral reefs and, and what they mean to our oceans and uh, you know our human population and, and life on Earth. I think that's the bit of the, the story that's missing. We always hear about coral bleaching and that's where the story stops, but that doesn't really mean anything to, to a lot of people. Um, you know, coral reefs are responsible for over half of the, the ocean's marine life in some shape, way or form during their, their life cycles. Um, so, you know, we lose coral reefs, effectively our oceans stop functioning. Um, there's a billion people around the equatorial zone that rely on coral reefs every single day for their daily sustenance, um, you know, food, uh, protection from wave energy. You know, where do those billion people go when coral reefs have disappeared? So these are really, really big social and you know biological questions that we need to consider, um, and I, I think that's the deeper story of how it will affect everybody. It, you might not think that you know coral bleaching is um, something that you're going to have to worry about, but you will have to worry about it when uh, our oceans stop behaving like oceans. Um, Charlie has just sat down. I want to give him a, a chance to say hi. Uh, Charlie, thank you so much for speaking with the, speaking with us today. How are you doing? Well, yeah, it was a um, big pleasure to talk today. And I had, a, I had one question for you. Uh, you. You both mentioned that you had been getting calls from uh, someone in Papua New Guinea about wanting to possibly set up a biobank um, for their coral reefs. Can you elucidate on that a little bit? That's one for them. Yeah, that's one for me. So yeah, getting calls from um, places around the world where, you know, the Northern Hemisphere right now is going through a bleaching event. And so, you know, there are places where there is high level bleaching, that's, you know, 90% or more uh, of corals actually bleaching underwater. And so these teams are contacting me saying, look, we've, we've tried to move our corals to shadier spots to what we think is cooler water and it's not working. What we actually need is life support systems for corals, effectively coral biobanks um, that are land-based facilities where you can control the environmental factors to a fine, uh, I guess, resolution to make sure that when the corals come in, every care is taken, uh, is, you know, I guess, looked after. Uh, and, and that's what our systems do. They are pure life support systems or five-star resorts for corals. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, Charlie, what, what thing happening right now, whether it's a piece of legislation, a policy or a movement, uh, gives you hope? 
I think all hope comes with the notion that we can speed up evolution through uh, technological intervention. But also uh, the other hope, source of hope is that corals are very innovative. They've been around for 200 million years. And so they're going to be very hard to completely wipe out. So we're talking in a world that corals may survive okay, but our enjoyment of the reef and what it means to humans is a very different matter. And so uh, our hope comes with um, the technology, but moving quickly. We haven't, we're out of time and we, we should have been where we are now many decades ago. We've left it very late in the, in the day. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sitting down and speaking with me. I do have to go, um, but it was a pleasure speaking with you. Yes. Okay. In a pleasure. And I uh, hope to meet again. Cheers. Next, I spoke with Adriana Burgess, a professor and marine ecologist at the University of New South Wales, who is the director of the Kelp Forest Alliance. Her work on kelp restoration in the Sydney area includes efforts at reintroducing species of kelp that were regionally wiped out in the 1980s from the city's formerly notorious water pollution issues. She discusses the arguably unsung importance of kelp forests in supporting marine life and sequestering carbon, which all told are equivalent to the size of the Amazon rainforest. She appeared on a panel moderated by professional server Dave Rastovich, which included panelist Josh Slab, a Gujanbura cultural conservationist. So, uh, Adriana, can you introduce yourself and your organization and the work that you're doing? Uh, my name is Adriana Verges. I'm a marine ecologist. I'm based at UNSW in Sydney and the Sydney Institute of Marine Science. And I'm also the director of the Kelp Forest Alliance. And um, so can you talk about the importance of kelp forests, um, especially in Sydney? I found it really interesting when you were speaking. You were talking about how um, how polluted the marine environments were around the city in the 1980s, but that a lot of restoration work has gone into making them better. Um, can you talk about how the work that you're doing is building upon that? Yeah, so here in Sydney, uh, we have a project called Operation Crayweed, which is restoring a beautiful species of, of kelp uh, called crayweed because crayfish, which is what we call rock lobster, associated with it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important species uh, for fishers, for example. It went missing in the 80s because of water pollution issues. So Sydney used to have a lot of um, sewage pollution, essentially. Back in the 80s, famous beaches like Bondi Beach would be closed for swimming 50% of the time. Um, so that water quality issue was solved with engineering solutions. So deep ocean outfalls that now, you know, they release the sewage, which is better treated um, kilometers offshore. And the water quality has improved and now the biodiversity and the marine life in Sydney is actually pretty good. But some species just never came back from that initial kind of pollution shock. And crayweed is one of them. And we have a project where now that the water quality is good enough, we are now reintroducing these species and reversing local extinction uh, for these species. And you mentioned that you had um, some urban ranger units. Uh, can you talk about uh, what, what they do and how you work with them? So we work in close collaboration with the Game Rangers. They're an indigenous ranger group. They were established only a few years ago, maybe five, six years ago. It's the first urban ranger group and they look after sea country in the Sydney area. So when we work together, we, you know, they help us. They, they, sometimes we, they skipper our vessels, they dive with us. But what I think is particularly exciting is their input in kind of helping us to restore not just the ecosystems, but the, the cultural connections to these special marine habitats. And you were earlier talking about the importance of MPAs, uh, marine protected areas. And um, I believe it was Dave, he, he said that actually, Sydney, not Sydney, uh, Australia has scaled a few of them back. Um, can you talk about uh, how that's changed over time? And do you think there's any push or movement for them to, to come back or more marine protected areas to come back? It's a tricky, it's a tricky one. Um, so we have some really amazing marine protected areas in Australia, like the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Right. Thirty percent of it is protected, and it's well, the whole, the whole marine, the whole of the Great Barrier Reef is a marine park, and thirty percent of that is in sanctuary zones where you can't do any fishing. So 
we know how to do it well and we have done it in lots of areas, but that's in the tropics, uh, kind of close to shore. We have a lot less protection um, in the rest of Australia. And there was a big, um, yeah, there was a big movement to, you know, at one point Australia was going to have the largest protected area of any country in the world. But then, yes, for political reasons, that was scaled back. And we're now at a point in time where the support for marine protected areas is, is, it's just not there if in the political uh, scene. I think, I think what's exciting though is the, you know, the, 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 the new kind of, our, our prime minister or, well, our environment minister has actually pledged to protect 30% by 2030, like a lot of other countries in the world. So if, if that really goes ahead, that's going to be in more protected areas. So we may be about to see a, a change in, in the attitudes. Um, something else I've been covering, which you know a lot of people cover, is the importance of coral reefs. But really, you, you honed in on the importance of kelp, especially in terms of you know, feeding marine life and also sequestering carbon. Can you just elucidate on that a little bit more? Yeah. So um, in Australia, uh, you know, most like the, set, the lower half of the continent is a, is, a, is a temperate zone that is dominated by kelp forests. Kelp forests dominate a quarter of the world's coastlines. When you put them all together, they're as large as the Amazon and they capture as much carbon as the Amazon. So they're an incredibly important ecosystem, but it's a lot less protected and there's a lot less awareness about their, env- their importance. So... Yeah, quite a few of us are now kind of coming together to try and increase awareness. And that's what the Kelp Forest Alliance is about. It's an alliance of kelp uh, experts from around the world um, coming together to raise awareness about these important ecosystems and also to protect and restore the kelp forest that we have lost. Uh, Adriana, thank you so much for speaking with me. Uh, Where would you direct listeners to go to if they want to learn more about you or your work? So a few websites, the kelpforestalliance.com. And then the Sydney Kelp project that I lead is called Operation Cravit, and that's operationcravit.com, and also we're on social media. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you. And finally, I spoke with Mike Black, who is the co-founder of an indigenous-led biotech startup based in Australia that uses electricity to enhance seeds, which are then sold to producers or farmers. I caught up with Mike following a panel discussion on farmers, food, and the front lines of climate change innovation, a discussion moderated by science communicator Lee Constable and featured panelists Dave Schilling and Mick Lubinskis. Mike spoke with me about the pressing challenges farmers contend with in the face of climate change and how other supply chain factors mean that producing food under the status quo is going to need to change. This was an interesting discussion on the problems faced by our global food systems and a way in which technology can build upon or enhance traditional knowledge of growing food. So, Mike, thank you so much for uh, speaking with me today. Uh, Can you really quick just tell our listeners what your company is and what you do? Yeah, I'm Mike Black from Rainstick and uh, our company, we we use electricity to mimic the natural effects of thunderstorms to make plants grow bigger, faster, and more sustainably. And so do you do that like physically with like an instrument in the soil? Yeah. Everyone has these ideas of crazy lightning machines out in broadacre farms. Um, It actually is a seed treatment process. So before the seeds are even planted, they are graded. We we receive the seeds. We put them through a, a chamber that's got a whole bunch of controls over it, and it creates an electric field. And that electric field changes uh, things inside the seed, which then it gets packaged back up again into bags and goes and gets sent out to the farm so that there's no changes on farm. It makes a very low friction intervention where farmers are already doing practices like this with using chemicals uh, and we're a non-chemical uh, alternative. And so what... What does that do to the seed and eventually the crop itself? I'm going to probably answer a lot of these questions with it depends. Uh, But if you think of most producers are looking for three things. They're looking for an increase in germination rates, which means that more of their seeds are viable um, because the same amount of effort goes into planting the seed, whether it grows or not. Uh, The other thing they're looking for is conformity. So that is that they all sort of grow around about the same pace. 
So that makes harvesting easier uh, and it makes it easier to time harvesting. It makes it easier to be able to make financial decisions around your harvest. And then the last one is early vigor. And that one's kind of a hard one to define, but early vigor is the plant's ability to be resilient. And uh, that can mean resilience to pests. It can mean resilience to uh, extreme weather events. It could mean ex- uh, resilience to less than ideal growing environments in general. So you, for one, one farmer, it might be, I want, I want a massive increase in yield and I've got fantastic soil. I'm not getting the most out of, I want to do this. For another farmer in another part of the world, they might be, I don't have great soil. I've got this horrible sandy soil. It's, it's pretty depleted. I'm just happy if anything grows. And so, um, and then other, other places will have more pests and so on. So that, er, that, that early vigor is a really good, uh, indicator of how well that plant will do throughout the rest of its, um, growth cycle. And so do, do you work uh, primarily in Australia or do you, do you work with, um, farms outside of the country? We would, so we've got, um, we have some, uh, grow, growing partners in the U S, um, and we're actually at the Singapore, um, agri food week in two weeks time. Okay. And hoping to start doing some work in Singapore as well. Singapore has a unique challenge in that they have this goal of uh, 30% of their produce by 2030. Uh, and they've only got about 4% at the moment. Mike is referencing Singapore's independent food production goals, as currently the vast majority of the city state's food is imported from outside the country. On the Singapore Food Agency's website, they state, That is why we're working towards 30 by 30 to build up our agri-food industry's capability and capacity to sustainably produce 30% of our nutritional needs by 2030. And so, and there's a lot of political weight that sits behind trying to get a solution. Uh, And, but then there's also that intellect around going, well, let's not do it the way that it has been done. And you can't do it the way it has been done. With the EU regulations that have come through, drop the about the amount of pesticide and fertilizers that you're allowed to use like some in some cases up to half uh you know and then you start looking at measuring the full esg and and sustainability pre- pressures around farming practice it's not really going to be solved in my opinion by doing the way that we've always done well certainly done for the last few hundred years this may like sound like a silly or obvious question, but but why 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 did you start this company? What when, what was the the brainchild for it exactly? Yeah, so um, being a student of science, um, and I mean that in the broader sense, um, uh, means you're relentlessly curious. And um, I started learning about my my co-founder uh, Daryl. He's a a proud Marawelli man, and the Marawelli, uh, First Nations Indigenous um, tribe to Australia, uh, in central Queensland area. And they had this practice where they would uh, bury this lightning rod, this chugara that they called, um, and, and, and they'd use it in ceremony to, to attract lightning. And now in, in this, in Australia, a lot of the seeds are, um, quite hard to germinate. They need to have some sort of extreme stress event. Um, and so what we found was interesting is there was all these anecdotal stories about that. We started looking in other cultures around the world. There was additional anecdotal stories in Japan and South America, and everybody has these stories about the effect of thunderstorms. And what can happen is because the information is not presented to you in a scientific manner, it's easy to dismiss it and consider it as being folklore or something along those lines. But to the truly inquisitive mind, you should follow it up. You should ask questions. You should ask the question, why? And a big moment for us was when we started talking to mushroom farmers and they said to us, when a big thunderstorm would come through, their little button mushrooms would be, would grow beyond button mushroom size overnight because and because the, the the storm had come through and it wasn't to do with nitrogen, it wasn't to do with rain because they're indoor cropping, so they weren't able to be affected by that. So that was a really, I guess you could say, sparked my interest to go, why? What, what is happening then? What is happening? And my background in uh, physics and electronics, uh, I, I tend to lean a bit on that. So uh, it started a very deep inquiry into, well, what happens in this electric world around us and how can that be recreated and how can that be 
used in a way that gives us an alternative to the way we've been doing things so far. And you and I were actually talking about this earlier about, you know, what, like the very definition of the word traditional techniques, traditional methods. Um, but it's pretty fair to say that y- your, you know, your company builds upon what I was saying some of those were. Uh, but can you elaborate on, on that? Do you build on traditional knowledge uh, of, of farming? Yeah, absolutely. And look, and part of that as well is to, to go into this with um, a sense of humility and persistence to, to not try to find the one thing that makes it work kind of concept, like to be able to listen to producers and hear what their actual goals are. For one, for one producer, it'll be pest reduction. For another one, it'll be, um, you know, like I said, the scenario with the sandy soil, it might be you know, what, whatever it is, and they'll have innovations that they've done themselves. And so before rushing in there and trying to be like, okay, here's, here's the one solution that solves everything, we end up building recipes with the producers. And these recipes involve our electric treatment, they involve what they're going to do in terms of their plant management, um, how, what, what their goals are, and it's a real consultative kind of piece because when you do that and you take that on and you really look at it holistically, um, you can find a lot of spaces where there's an opportunity f- for improvement and where there's inefficiencies that may be downstream creating major issues or being the reason why you couldn't achieve your goals that you had. Um, we also talked about this a little bit earlier, but some of the work that you do supports First Nations communities. But I would like to give the microphone over to you to explain how how you do that exactly. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're a proud and in, uh, indigenous uh, led company. Uh, like I said, my my co founder Daryl is a proud Marawelli man, and what we found is it, it's actually quite difficult to explore how to do that properly in terms of having a framework to do that. So we're sort of moving forward in that space as an example for other companies to understand how do you correctly acknowledge First Nations intellectual property? Um, Australia's not part of the Nagoya Protocol and uh, we have some limited understanding around uh, ICIP, intellectual uh, property for indigenous cultures. Um, But for us, it's about doing the best we can, being best in breed, actually allowing for there to be enough time for consultation, enough time for reflecting and respect on on the knowledge that's shared with us. Like it's it's an absolute privilege to be able to go out on country and see where this chugara was formed in the stone and and buried in a place and and understand how that affected their whole practice. And and you wouldn't it's one of those deep learning experiences that I can't describe to you until you stand there and you stand on that rock and you look out there and you're like, oh yeah, I can see you know there's that over here and that's over there. Um and it's an absolute privilege to be able to have that information shared with us um, and to build upon that and to not take that away. So one of the things we've done is we've um, implemented a 1% pledge um, to the Marawelli Foundation to continue to respectfully tell the story of, of the, the Chugara. We're telling a narrative, but we're also bound by telling a narrative that is respectful, that meets the way that we're allowed to say it, that we're not making up any parts of it, that we're, we're being extremely respectful and that we're only temporary custodians of that story. It is still their story to tell. And um, something else that you mentioned in your talk is that uh, it, as part of being like a for-profit company, it allows you to expand a lot quicker than say, you know, academic research would. Um, but you also mentioned that you recently bought a World War II bunker in Serbia. Uh, I w- can you please uh, explain a little bit more about what what that's about? So I so one of <laughs> sorry uh, yeah so one of our one of our amazing um, rain stick team uh, he's a, a crazy physicist in Serbia and um, uh, when we were starting out and, and we we're bootstrapping this so um, which was only uh, January last year so. Um, it was a crazy idea and I was, I had a full on Breaking Bad style set up in my garage at home. It was really sus with grow tents and well, crazy lightning machines and stuff like that in my garage at home. Um, we 
realized that we couldn't actually do some of the testing here in Australia. We First of all, we couldn't get access to the equipment that we needed. And then the regulatory framework around that was quite challenging. Uh, no, no such of those challenges existed in Serbia. So our, um, uh, our, our team member at the time um, was like, hey, there's this place. It's sort of underground. It's got great airflow. It's got good temperature control. It's thick concrete. It's, uh, and so we ended up getting a lease. Our, 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 we signed a lease for a, for a, this, um, essentially bunker in Serbia. And, um, uh, I remember when I was signing it, um, his, we're on a video call together and I couldn't even read the thing. Um, cause it's taking around the video call and he's like, you know, Mike, this textbook crazy. I'm like, yes, it is textbook crazy. And it's the only thing you can do when you're a startup and you're not a research organization, because I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have passed ethics or whatever, I'm sure. Something else you mentioned uh, that really hit home for me um, is, well, I, th- I mean, I think this hits home for everybody, uh, is that if we've tasted one banana, we've tasted them all, which is the Cavendish. Um, and there's a huge, horrible history behind that, um, that we don't need to go into. But do you think there's more in light of something like that and the vulnerability of the Cavendish, do you think there's room for, you know, perhaps bringing back more species of things like bananas to help combat the growing food insecurity problems that we're facing? Yeah, definitely. And and that's a big challenge because as consumers, we are driving that. There's a reason why there's a bag of capsicum seeds that's $250,000 a kilo which is crazy. It's because they've got a bit more sugar in them and they're a little bit sweeter. So same with the, with the bananas, when you, when you tissue culture stuff out and, and you try to breed out the variations so much, so you get a perfect, perfectly shaped, perfectly colored banana. If we just accepted that some food isn't as pretty and isn't as tasty, it's probably actually more nutritious. Uh, I think eating habits, if they were to change, I, I think it's one feeds the other in a sense that we optimize food for who's going to buy the sweetest and tastiest and col- most colorful food. At the same time, when you've got the opportunity to buy uh, uh, a slightly bitter lettuce or a slightly, you know, whatever that might have a higher calcium content or something, or this really delicious one over here, um, you tend to pick the, the prettier and more delicious one. I think looking nutrition as no longer a commodity, but as an essential human need will help change the way that we shop. It'll help change the way that we optimize for people who buy, because at the end of the day, consumers are the ones that actually have all the power. Um, And so my final question to you is, do you think that, you know, what you're doing, what you're working on is incentivizing that for the consumer? We are working with the producers at the moment who are facing unprecedented challenges around how are they going to, how are they going to produce more food at a time where climate's more difficult, uh, extreme weather events, um, increase in pests and disease, and they can't use the chemicals and the fertilizers that they used to use, and they have to feed another 2 billion people uh, at a time of global supply cha- challenge. There's a lot of converging factors there. And then you add on top of that ESG reporting and corporate pressures around making sure that you're, you know, operating sustainably. So at this point in time, we're, we're looking to provide hope to those producers that are kind of going home at night and thinking, well, how the hell am I supposed to do that? What, what does farming look like 10 years from now? And that's an interesting question because it can't look like what it does today. Well, Mike, thank you so much for speaking with me today. And, uh, I have a wonderful South by Southwest. Thank you very much. If you want to learn more about the work from these panelists, you can find more information in the show notes or by checking out the Forever Reef Project at foreverreef.org, rainstick at rainstick.com.au, and the Kelp Forest Alliance at kelpforestalliance.com. As always, if you're enjoying the Manga Bay Newscast or any of our podcast content like our sister series Manga Bay Explorers, and you want to help us out, You can spread the word about the work we're doing by telling a friend. Word of mouth is the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. But you can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash manga bay. 
We are a nonprofit global news outlet. Even just a dollar per month really does help us offset production costs. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com forward slash Mongabay to learn more and support the Mongabay newscast. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the Mongabay newscast over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either App Store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to find us on social media, look for us on most of the platforms out there, which include LinkedIn, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Facebook, and TikTok where our handle is at Mongabay, and also on YouTube at Mongabay TV. We really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks, as always, for listening.